Uh, I'm Spencer Grahowski, this year's student body president of MBA. And uh, before I get into what I'm going to say, I'd like to thank all of you guys just for being here. Um, this conference represents how much each of you care about your students. Um, you're willing to take a day and a half just to think about them as people. Um, and I think that that's amazing that you do this. So thank you. Neil O'Donnell quarterbacked in the National Football League for 14 seasons from 1990 to 2003. Throughout his career, Mr. O'Donnell has played for the Steelers, Jets, Bengals, and our own Tennessee Titans. Mr. O'Donnell is um, known as being one of the most endearing Titans to have played on the team. Uh, he became one of the team's most respected personalities in and out of the locker room um, and in, in the community during his tenure with the Titans. On the field, he was widely considered one of the most best and most proven backup quarterbacks in the league, um, serving as a mentor for names like Steve McNair and Billy Volick, um, and among others. He earned his first Pro Bowl invitation following the 1992 season and led the Steelers to Super Bowl 30 in 1995. He earned his first, um, or excuse me, after football, he worked as a sports analyst um, for CBS uh, as an affiliate for Titans games in Nashville, currently works for Field Turf in Kentucky and Tennessee, and his two sons, Dylan and Devin, attended NBA. Our current athletic director, Mark Tipps, who's been here for five years, will be engaging in a Q&A with Mr. O'Donnell um, about issues related to raising boys and uh, things of that nature. He's a husband and a father of three children, Annie, Grace, and John. Mark Tipps was previously a partner at the law firm Bass, Barry, and Sims here in Nashville. In 1995, he served as Senator Frist's chief of staff, and in 1990, um, worked as a campaign manager for Lamar Alexander. He then moved back to Nashville and opened his law firm, and today you'll find him working as our athletic director, uh, teaching economics and government, and helping coach baseball. In the classroom, he gives an insight into politics and economics that requires past experience in the field, whether it's telling humorous stories or showing how the material applies to his students' everyday life. Coach Tips keeps them engaged through his personality and ability to connect with his audience. During baseball season, Coach Tips is renowned for being uh, one of the team's designated pitchers in the batting cage. And uh, while he helps to work on a fundamental element of any player's game, uh, Halo by Beyonce is one of several R&B songs that, um, that Coach Tips will enjoy with his players. One of his greatest passions in his role as athletic director is instilling a sense of excellence in the students by challenging them to take the path less traveled. One way he does this is by walking them through the process of using athletics to leverage themselves into the highest academic school possible. He uses the phrase, aim high, daily, and his work and career show he has, done, he has done just that. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mark Tips and Neil O'Donnell. And as uh, Neil and Mark make their way to the stage, we've had so much interest uh, in, the, in our wellness center that I thought I would just show a two and a half minute walkthrough video of it, and Mark will say a couple things about it afterwards before they start their Q&A.
you guys hear me in the back okay? <coughs> Good. I, I've been having some um, voice problems this week and uh, had to speak three times, and so it never got better, but I think with this mic we'll be okay. Normally in this room we don't always use one, but uh, probably a smart thing to do it today. Um, real quickly about that video you saw. First of all, Neil and I are going to talk for a little while, and then we'll I'll throw it open to questions, and hopefully you will have some questions for him or for me about what we discuss or about his career. Um, and I'm also happy to answer any questions about that facility. <coughs> it's a large facility. It's 200,000 square feet. To put that in perspective, uh, all of the buildings on this campus under roof are about 200,000 square feet. So it almost doubles our under roof um, capacity. It will have uh, an assembly area that you saw. We, will, we have assemblies every Monday. It will also be our home basketball court. Um, it will have new locker rooms, uh, weight room, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, training room, coaches' offices, some meeting rooms. Right now we don't have a place where our football or basketball team, for example, can watch film. They sit on the floor of a locker room and watch it up against a wall. Um, it's going to have uh, three squash courts. So from you all from the Northeast, we're, we're trying to catch up with you on squash <clears throat> with the if you build it, they will come attitude. And uh, going to have three golf bays. It will have um, three practice basketball courts, full-size basketball courts. It will have a new wrestling facility where on, for dual meets, we'll actually be able to host them there as opposed to having to go to one of the gyms. Um, and it has an indoor turf practice facility. Neil's company will be providing the turf as they have for everything we have here, field turf. Um, and it's a football field regulation width and about 45 yards long, and it'll be fully netted. And it's sort of patterned after something that I saw uh, at Middlebury College up in Vermont where my son just graduated. They have a an indoor field house. It's much larger, has a 200-meter track, but the, the turf piece of it's netted. And so the baseball team could go in there. He played baseball. They could go in there in the dead of winter and have, you know, full infield, partial outfield, take hitting, take infield. Uh, depending on how you net it, the, the lacrosse team can use it, the soccer team can use it, the track team can use it. Obviously, our football team can and will use it. Um, so it'll be a, a multifaceted use for that thing. And then our fitness area is a two-level area. It's got a main uh, area and then a mezzanine. Together, it's about 15,000 square feet. Our current weight room, which is a lot nicer than anything I ever had in high school, is about 3,500 square feet. <clears throat> and, and what I really uh, like most about that is that while it will help our team sports for sure, no question, it will. All of these facilities will help our team sports. I think some of the kids who will get the best benefit out of this will be kids who don't play team sports. And some of you are, are you know, I'm sure are coaches and, and administrators, you've seen this. But we have boys, we have a requirement that if a boy, for example, is, is uh, participating in robotics, that he has to come twice a week and do some type of physical fitness, physical education. And so he comes with a coach and they come into the weight room. And I'm sure you've all probably seen this, but when our weight room has three varsity teams in there lifting, <laughs> Yeah, I hear somebody chuckling because you know where I'm going. And you got guys on the football team squatting and benching, and then here comes this kid who's really never been in a weight room before. And you can sense he feels judged, he feels very self-conscious, he's not comfortable being in there, and they kind of migrate back to the wall and then migrate out. They just don't want to be there. Um, I think this new facility is going to do wonders for that kid. There are going to be so many other places and opportunities for them to go, places in that weight room where they can go and learn to use free weights because they don't maybe don't know how to do that and get to a place where they have confidence and feel okay being with, with other guys who are doing it all the time. And when you think about that in terms of their long-term physical and mental health, I think 
um, that's really a plus. And that, that may be the thing that is best about this whole facility is not what it does for our varsity sports, but what it does for, for our kids who aren't on varsity teams but who maybe get passed over a little bit right now because we, we, we put them in a place where we make them pretty self-conscious and they feel pretty judged. So I'm excited about the facility from that standpoint. And again, I'll be happy to answer any questions about that facility when, when Neil and I get to our end, okay? Ready to start? All right. Um, I'll do my best with my voice. <laughs> Neil, if I, if, I falter, take over. if I falter, you ask yourself questions and I give keep the moving answers, like okay? this, you'll know why. No, I don't feel I'm a bad. germ freak, no, you know that. I don't feel bad. All right. I told him I'm gonna, it's going to be like a witness on the stand. I'm going to ask you a long leading question to get all of our background stuff in. But you are from Madison, New Jersey, which I think is not too far. From, we, got, we have some New Jersey people here, by the way. What school? Del Barton. Del Barton. Know it very well. Yep. Yeah. Um, Madison's not too far out of uh, Morristown, I think. And you grew up there in a family with nine kids, six brothers, three sisters. Dad, I think, ran a, had a car dealership. Um, and you, you played multiple sports in, in high school. Um, remind me, football, basketball, and what else? Baseball. And you played a little soccer, I think, at some point. Soccer younger in my years yeah. when, uh, you know, I was a tall, skinny kid growing up, and uh, they wanted me to, you know, play up at a sport because I couldn't make this certain weight limit. So my dad chose not to do that, and he just said, you aren't going to sit around the house. So I did play soccer for three years, which actually helped me. Absolutely. And obviously at some point, I know you must have been uh, uh, excelled tremendously at football because you ended up at the University of Maryland. But as I understand it, you probably had as many offers or more as a basketball player. And that was it. Uh, you know, I played multiple sports like Mark said, but my love and my true sport was basketball. And I'm not uh, patting myself on the back in any ways, but I did average a little under 29 points a game with no three-point line. So... Uh, I had dual scholarships to go around the country to play both sports, football and basketball. And uh, when I chose University of Maryland, I went down there. Bobby Ross was a head coach, and Lefty Drizel was a head basketball coach. So I was dual recruited there, and uh, I found out real quickly that I couldn't even sit on the bench with those players at University of Maryland. I don't know if some of you recall, but that was uh, the Len Bias era. Yeah. And uh, rest in peace, Lenny. He was a great man, a great basketball player, but that talent was a lot better than I could provide for him. So I left the basketball team and, and focused on football. And that was back in the day when, <coughs> um, by the way, Maryland feared the turtle, right? Fear Correct. The turtle. Yeah. Um, that was back in the day when Maryland was in the ACC, and today they're in the Big Ten. And you mentioned Bobby Ross. I think he went on – coached at Alabama, he coached at, I remember him coaching at Georgia Tech and ran the wishbone down there and won a national championship, I believe, didn't he? Yep, and Bobby was a great recruiter, great man, and, uh, you know, people always ask me what schools it came down to, and uh, as, as Mark mentioned earlier, I came from a real competitive family. I had five brothers who played Division I football, so I had a brother at Penn State, I had a brother at Michigan, I had a brother at Duke, and I had a brother in New Hampshire. So uh, it was like, where do you want to go? And I was getting recruited very heavily to go where one of my brothers played football because they all thought they had an in. So it came down to University of Alabama or University of Maryland. And at the time, why Alabama is 24 hours from my home. And uh, my dad worked around the clock, and uh, he flew me down there and said, drive home and tell me if you still want to go there. <laughs> And uh, it was 26 and a half hours to come home. And um, my brother and I said, you aren't going to school here. So I chose Maryland because of uh, the quarterback tradition they had there. They had five quarterbacks going to the NFL. And uh, if everything worked out right, I thought I'd have a chance to play the next level. And uh, it worked out well for me. So you were second, uh, third round pick, number two pick in the third round, I believe, <clears throat> and um, went with Pittsburgh. You ended up playing 14 years in the NFL. That's a long time. You don't see a lot of guys today playing 14 years. It was uh, like you see it now, like when now the way they cover the NFL draft, we just had it here in Nashville, and it was an amazing event. 
how exciting it was. But when I was drafted, it was kind of like you sit around the TV and you wait for the phone to ring. So there's no, unless you're like the top five picks, you go to the stage in New York. I was, supposedly my agent was Lee Steinberg, and he told me I was supposed to go to the Seattle Seahawks in the second round. But back then you didn't have to declare as a junior if you're coming out or not. So uh, Andre Ware came out at Illinois, and so did, uh, uh, not, not, uh, Jeff George came out first. He was out of Illinois, and Andre Ware came out of Houston. So they went one, two. So here I am, the coverage leaves the TV, and I'm still not drafted. So it's kind of a weird feeling, like you hear these horror stories about draft day, and thank God I didn't have a party or anything in my house, but it left the air, and sure enough, 10 minutes later, thank God I was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Good thing they didn't have Twitter, but you've been tweeting, oh, yeah. <laughs> tweeting, tweeting out stuff that you'd regretted. Yep. Um, you ended up playing for the Steelers and the Jets and the Bengals and the Titans, uh, made the Pro Bowl in 92. In 96, you got to uh, be in a Super Bowl. In 2000, with the Titans, you were in a Super Bowl. In 96, you were the starting quarterback for the Steelers in Super Bowl 30. And I remember that. That was that Dallas team with Troy Aikman and Emmitt Smith, Michael Irvin, pretty talented group. What was that like playing in that Super Bowl? It was the longest, longest game in the history. I mean, Super Bowls are a lot of – sitting around waiting halftime. I know everyone enjoys halftime, the live entertainment, but as a player, you're sitting in that locker room for over an hour, and that's hard as a player. But I, look, I overlooked the whole thing about who I was drafted by. I was drafted by Chuck Knoll, Hall of Fame coach, and then uh, a young guy came in in my third year, and his name was Bill Cower, and no one knew nothing about him. And I, I played in four AFC championship games uh, in my career, and I'll never forget when you fall short in an AFC, AFC championship game, it's almost like you hear your coach say, well, we knocked on the door, but next year we're going to knock it down. And you look at that coach like he's absolutely insane because emotionally you're exhausted, physically you're exhausted, and it takes so much luck and hard work to get back to go to a Super Bowl. And you hear about Tom Brady and six championships. It's really an amazing Thing they do up there in New England. It really is because somehow they all come together as a team and find a way to win, win Super Bowls, and it's not that easy. It's just not talent alone. There's a lot of teams that I've been on that are loaded with talent, and uh, we can't beat the local college. You Speaking of coaches, you got to play for three Hall of Fame coaches. You played for excuse me, Bill Parcell, Coward, as you mentioned, and Chuck Noll. Uh, what were they like? It was almost, you know, you look at all – coaches I played for and uh, Chuck Knoll called me McDonald the first two years and I swear he did it for a reason he wanted as a rookie he wanted me to gain his respect and he was like this never really said a word up or down very very consistent about the way he coached the way he spoke to the team Bill Cower was a rah-rah guy young aggressive coach he would hang out with his players after big wins and that was actually a blessing, you know, to be around a young, aggressive coach like that after having Chuck Knoll. And then you look at Bill Parcells. And uh, Bill Parcells let all his assistants do their job. So what Bill was good at doing, he was very good at motivating. He was a very good motivator. He put fear in players, which I don't see in the NFL anymore. So he would call you out in practice and tell you, if you don't do your job, I'm putting so-and-so in. And guess what? He would do it. He didn't care what round you were drafted in, how much money you made. But if you weren't going to do it his way, you weren't going to play. And I see that now in college and in the NFL, that it's where you're drafted and, and, and how much money you're bringing or how much money you're making. Coaches are afraid to pull the trigger and put someone else in there. I know that when you retired up until just recently, I think Aaron Rodgers broke your record, <clears throat> you had the lowest – uh, interception to attempt ratio. I think you threw two interceptions for every 100 attempts. Aaron Rodgers beat that in the last couple of years, but that's something that stood for quite a while. It did, and I kind of, you know, you look back at everything when you're all said and done, and uh, I prepared. I was a big film guy. I, I spent a lot of time in the film room watching tape, studying. 
I never like when a player says, no one works harder than I do. How, do. how do you know that? I mean, we don't know that. We don't spend enough time with all these other players to see how hard they work. But I was a big film guy. I studied the game. I studied my opponent. I, I was very, very concerned. I wanted to take every snap at practice. When I've been around other quarterbacks who've been starting for a long time, they don't like to practice. And I wanted to take every snap because I wanted to see it. And I wanted to tell my offensive coordinator, by Friday, I like this play, or no, let's get rid of it. I haven't completed it all week in practice. Let's get rid of it. So I was a big preparation guy. I still am. And what I do now at work, I, I'm kind of old school in a way. I write everything down. I still have a daily planner. I could tell you seven years ago what I did on this day. Uh, I'm not really in the... We do use Salesforce, but it's not my thing, and I know how to do all that, but it's really not my thing. But I'm very old school about always writing things down and attention to detail. And as far as the family goes, you're married to Leslie, and you've got three kids. You have <coughs> Devin and Dylan, both of whom went here. Devin was in my son's class here, um, 2015, and Dylan was probably about 2017 or so, and sure. was in my, he, was in, he was in one of the first classes I taught. He was in my American government class, a really sweet kid. And then your daughter is at? Brentwood Academy. Brentwood Academy. And what grade is she? She's a junior, Darren Rose. Darren Rose, okay, she's a junior. And Neil and I first met a long time ago because Devin and my son John were at Oak Hill School together, which is a feeder school here at the NBA. So we got to know each other some time ago, right after you had retired and I was still practicing law. I will tell you one quick story. You probably don't even remember this. But um, if you want to know how good these guys are playing in the NFL, so one day Devin and John were uh, playing basketball. And so he and I were over there at uh, one of those church, covenant church, I think it was. Do you remember what I'm going to tell? <laughs> <laughs> and so after the practice was over, I thought, well, you know, I I played small college football. I was a wide receiver. I'll throw some ball with him. He'll, he'll see how good my hands are, even still at 42 or 3. So we started throwing, and it was pretty, pretty good. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to show him I have a pretty good arm, too. So we started throwing the length of the court. It's about 30 feet, right? I mean, 30 yards. So he's, you know, and he's flicking it in there. And then I walked down by him, and I took the ball, and I said, what do you think, I, you think, what do you think chances are I can get it in that basket? And he's like, you know, not good. <laughs> I'm like, you know, and I hit the backboard. It wasn't bad, you know, from 30 yards, hit the backboard. I swear to God, I'm not kidding you. I flipped him the ball. First attempt, it went – not it didn't hit the rim. It went through. We used to do that as a drill, though. Like, we used to always throw to – we used to throw that to garbage cans, and when the weather was bad, they would always take the quarterbacks I want you to think about inside. what that means, yeah. that it went through. Yeah. So, not – to hit the rim is like, you know, this from 30 yards off. But it had to have the right exact arc to go through. So it went through, and I looked, and I went, there is no way you can do that again. Threw it back to him. And he didn't do it the second time, but he did rim it out, you know. And that's when I went, okay, yeah. it's time to quit. I'll <laughs> get out of here. Do you remember that at oh, all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, I was yep. amazed by that. Yep. Well, let's move a little bit. We'll come back to NFL here in a second, but I want to talk about some other things and sort of life lessons and kids, and we'll come back to a couple of questions about NFL sort of things. Nine – kids in a family that was an interesting dinner table what did you what kind of life lessons did you learn from your dad and mom with nine kids or your older brothers that you've passed on to your boys well I I looked at you know I look overlook what my dad was I really didn't know my father till probably when I was in college when he sold the dealerships because my dad back then you know he worked nine to nine on Monday nine to six on Tuesday, nine to five on Wednesday, nine to nine on Thursday, nine to five on Friday, nine to five on Saturday. He ran two car dealerships and uh, he was only home really for dinner. And then uh, that's when I saw my dad and I would go to school and do that. He would come to practice sometimes, but really he kind of, he, he was raising nine kids and uh, he, he worked around the clock. But what I learned as, as as mentors and who was it was probably my brothers. My brothers, I tip my hat to. They, they included me in everything. They were told to include me, even if I was younger or not, to include me in anything they do. Going to the movies, playing sports. I was always with my brothers driving around as a young kid, good and bad. I saw the Allman Brothers at a young age. 
you know. That's uh, I uh, probably shouldn't have been there, but uh, I saw them. Yep. Uh, but it was uh, it was the competitiveness of my brothers teaching me to play sports, and I look back on on my dad's role. We sat down for dinner every night at six o'clock, and I think in the world we live in right now, including my house, sometimes. You know, it's hard for a family to sit down and eat around a table and talk and ask how your day was. And when you have nine kids, my mom wasn't going to reheat something at 7.15 because you had practice. We were home at 6 o'clock. If we were going to eat dinner, we were going to be home at 6 o'clock. And that's where we learned how to talk as a family. We didn't have phones back then. The TV was off. And we, we, we learned how to communicate, how to sit up straight. I'll never forget my mom would do this and teach you how to eat like this. And it was a very, very, you know, back then, why are we, why are we doing this? But I look at now how raising kids, how, you know, mannerism and simplifying their lives is so difficult because uh, there's so many distractions out there with the phones and all things like that. So I look at my dad, when he sold the dealerships, he came to every game in college, even if I didn't play. And I'll tell you a story. I was redshirted my first year at Maryland. They put out some very good quarterbacks, Boomer Esiason, Stan Galbaugh, Dan Henning, uh, Scott Zolak. We all played in the NFL. But uh, I was kind of disappointed I was redshirted my first year because uh, I wanted to play. I never sat on the bench, never knew about not preparing on, for a game on Saturday. So what happens is I start goofing around and I had a 1.9 my first semester. And back then it was not like where they send uh, an email to your dad, they send a hard copy to 12 Woodcliffe Drive in Madison, New Jersey. So my dad got word of this and read it and he said, okay, there's gonna be changes, didn't tell me a word about it. I knew my dad was upset because my mom warned me about it. And uh, I came out one day to go to practice and my car was gone. Oh no, I gotta call dad now. Tell him my car was stolen. So I call the police first and ask him, you know, dad 67 plate, dealer plate, have you seen it? Blah, 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 this and that. No, Mr. O'Donnell, we have no recollection of that car being stolen, blah, 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 this and that. My dad sent, me da sent someone down to pick up my car without even telling me and left. Didn't say hello, didn't say, just took the car. So I was actually relieved in a way. That, that my dad had my car. He didn't give it back till I got a 3.2. And uh, he told me, he said, I don't care how far you throw the football. I don't care how smart you think you are. If you don't get a great education, you get hit in that knee one day, you'll never play another game of football, and you'll need your brain and your academics and your major to go do something in life. And uh, I didn't come home no joke, for almost a year and a half. I went to double summer schools, and I got my grades up to over 3-2, and I learned that lesson from my father, just taking my car and making me wake up and say, it's not all about football, son. It's all about a lot bigger things than just the game of football. And remember, it is a game. So how I raise my kids, you know, I, I want to raise them all to be polite, no drugs, Keep over 3 0, and dad won't bother you. <laughs> Once it drops, one of those factors you aren't doing. And they learned it pretty quickly. And uh, I went to a public school. Uh, I chose to send my kids to private schools, and uh, they figured it out pretty quickly because uh, they heard the stories of how my dad was so intimidating. And, and so demanding on so many things outside of football because he didn't coach me. He didn't have, like people say to me sometimes, oh, it must have been great having a catch with your dad in the backyard. You know how many catches I had with my dad in the backyard? Zero. I had my brothers there. I used to look at my dad sometimes. He would drop me off at football camps. So we would drive to Penn State football camp, a Boston College football camp, and he'd give me the application with $300 in cash in my hand. Everyone would be in line with their parents or five guys from their high school. I would be by myself with no parents, 
No one from my high school. Kind of awkward. Kind of uncomfortable. But you know what it taught me how to do? Get noticed and get up in front of the lines to be the best you possibly can. So by the end of the week, I knew a lot of those kids because I was throwing, if not the same or better than them. So I was noticed. And I used to ask my dad, Dad, that was horrible. He used to drop me off and turn around and drive back to New Jersey. And I'd stand in line by myself, not knowing anyone. I wouldn't be hugging goodbye to their parents. He did it for a reason, to make me uncomfortable, to make me grow up, and to learn how to get in front of that line. And that's competing in the game of football. I want to come back to some life issues and, and issues having to do with boys. But real quickly, I want to ask you a few things about the NFL. So who, who was your favorite teammate that you've ever played with? Probably Merrill Hodge, my uh, fullback with the Steelers. Uh, Merrill uh, went to BYU, great guy. Uh, actually lived with him for about four years. And uh, I still talk to Merrill to this day. He was my closest friend. The guy I respected the most was probably my center, Damani Dawson. He played ball at Kentucky. He's in the Hall of Fame right now. Gentle giant, never swore, never drank. Uh, barely lift weights, happy, good, lucky guy, and loved chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and he was a gentle giant and a wonderful guy to be around. Uh, on our team, the best athlete by far with the Steelers was Rod Woodson. Rod Woodson would get on. He was a defensive back out of Purdue. He was also in the Hall of Fame. He would get on a treadmill and run eight miles an hour backwards. Don't try it. Don't try it. <laughs> Backwards, eight miles an hour. You mean 8.0 on the thing. Backward. Yeah, that's hard to do. Forward. Who did, you, um, who did you least like to play against? Who put the fear of God in you the most? Well, people always say, uh, who hit you the hardest? Who did you fear? Looking back, you know, you see nowadays everyone was afraid of Ray Lewis. You know, that was the big fear factor. But Ray never scared me because he was right in the middle. And he, was, he talked the whole game, but he was right in the middle. Uh, my second year, I started 13 games for the Steelers, and there was a guy who wore number 56 for the New York Giants. His name was LT. <laughs> uh, Lawrence Taylor was the first stand-up linebacker who could run a 4-5 at 265 pounds. And he did scare you. <laughs> and uh, he talked a lot, and he, uh, he was a guy that you had to account for because he was that good of a player. He dominated the game from one side of the field, and he did it. He ran all over the place, and that was the guy you didn't want to play. And, and of course, if you look back on the schedule, I don't know if you remember the Monday night football game, we played them two weeks later after he compound fractured Joe Theismann's leg. And after I saw that watching that game, I was like, oh, man, do I still want to do this? because that was a gruesome injury that Joe Theismann suffered from LT. Yep. Um, how has the NFL changed since we, you, you and I, I'm a few years older than you, um, but you know, we remember we were talking some a day or two ago about some of the old timers, you know, watching guys. I, gr I grew up in the Twin Cities and watched the Vikings lose three Super Bowls. Um, and I remember guys like Fran Tarkington and Alan Page and Carl Eller and and um, these guys worked in the off season, and they were part of the community. They didn't jump from one team to the other. Um, and when I look at the NFL today, it, it doesn't really resemble what I remember as a kid. You were there. What, what do you see in the, in the last 20 years, 25, 30 years or so, in terms of changes? I just look at the locker rooms changed a lot. I mean, I still had an opportunity after 14 years uh, in the NFL uh, the Minnesota Vikings came to me and wanted me to play another two years and guarantee real good money for me to move my family to Minnesota. And uh, I noticed that the locker room was totally different. I mean, these kids now who come out of college, the Floridas, the Alabamas, they are so privileged compared to when I came out of Maryland and my head coach called me McDonald for two years. So it's, it's a different athlete coming in the NFL right now and uh, I look at you know just the the game in general it is so uh, just to give you an example I signed the largest contract for a quarterback in NFL history in 1996 I signed a five-year deal for 25 million 
I was on the front page with uh, Wayne Gretzky as Sports Illustrated. Aaron Rodgers makes $28 million a year now. So how can a coach coach a guy who's making $28 million a year? Or how can a coach, and good for them. I kind of, I, I speak at all these Players Association events, and I'm proud that that TV revenue is getting these players to make that type of money. But I'm also very sad about all the guys who paved the way, like you were talking about, who health issues, can't work, their resumes, oh my gosh, some of their resumes is like, you know, playing in the National Football League and that's it. It's, uh, it, it's really sad. So I think that, that the, the game of football right now has changed so much because it's driven by money. And what drives it by money is the TV revenue. And it's so much, when, I, when we go to Super Bowl, I, I was asking someone if the Titans win. I, I've been to 14 Super Bowls. I took all my kids to many of them. Like Mark said, I played in two of them. But I asked my agent, who has a big party every year at the Super Bowl, Lee Steinberg, I saw him last year in Atlanta. And I said, uh, remember the days when we used to sign all the footballs before kickoff. So what, what they do is you sit here like Mark and I, and they set up a little camera, and they ask you how many balls you want to sign, meaning footballs. And I look at Troy Aikman, and I look at him, and I said, well, so you bring him by freight train if you want. We were paying us, a, they were paying us $100 a signature back then. Now they get $1,000 a signature. So that's just what this game and corporate America has brought to the NFL. And it's scary. It's really scary because when is it going to get back to just playing the game of football? It's all about the money and the, and the glamour and the exposure and the dances, and I'm better than the law, I'm better than you because I played in the NFL, you did not. It's what we're creating this environment is really scary. It really is because uh, I still go in a lot of locker rooms and it is a lot different when I was in those locker rooms because when I was a rookie, I didn't say much at all. Just kind of kept my mouth shut and I kind of just brought my way up to what I was respected in the organization, especially my teammates and then you start getting a little more vocal. Well, let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> changes and how that's also affecting kids nowadays. To be a quarterback in you know, anywhere, whether you're playing in college, even high school for that matter, but particularly the NFL, you have to be extremely well prepared, which means that you, somewhere along the line you had to learn some discipline. You had to learn the ability to drill down and focus on something for a long time. Um, I don't know about you, but when, when I see kids today, I'm a little worried about sort of attention span and just sort of the focus on ability to focus and drill down on one thing and discipline. How important was discipline to you, and, and do you see any issues like that when we talk about raising boys today? Well, I look at it, we didn't have the distractions they have now with the cell phones and, and the social media and the Snapchat and all those things. Uh, I look at it as, you know, I always say to my wife especially, if I didn't have kids, I wouldn't own a phone. Because we all know looking at a text or looking at a Snapchat could ruin your day like that. And uh, I think nowadays with kids that you guys are all dealing with every day, it's instant gratification, it's, it's, it's fitting in, it's, I have a boy who uh, just accepted a job, my oldest one, Devin, in New York, and he's a wonderful young man, but he's always about waiting for the next parade. Like, he can't, he can't enjoy what's happening at the moment right now, he does, but then he wants to know what's happening next. And then I have another child who could care less about when the next parade's coming or, or what's happening tomorrow. He's just a lot mellower. So you kind of want that balance. You want the drive. But, but with everything now in, in, in instant, 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 we need to get this. We need to have this. Uh, So-and-so, I have a 17-year-old daughter, and if she doesn't go to the uh, Maroon 5 concert, Dad, that's horrible. You know, it, it's like, you know, and it's kind of like, honey, it's a concert. There will be background. But everyone else is going. And they learn all that from their cell phones 
because it's a group chat and they all said it out there. And I did not have that distraction, which I'm kind of glad. And uh, I was more or less just, uh, you know, playing with my brothers in the backyard. I was from a small town, Madison, New Jersey, where we walked downtown and got pizza on Friday nights and, and did things like that. Now that doesn't exist in our world, with, especially with teenagers. Uh, it's all about, you know, fitting in and the, and the pressure of, of getting those tickets and the pressure of uh, getting invited to that party. And it's, uh, it's a totally different world. And, and I don't know how we fix that. Because technology is wonderful, but it's also very hurtful. Well, you touch on something there that I, that's one of my pet peeves that I'm seeing. It's not, not just in high school kids, but it's, uh, it's across the board in sports. I am so tired of watching a defensive lineman, for example, who makes a tackle at the line of scrimmage, which is what he's supposed to do. That's his job. And then he runs down the field 20 yards, beating his chest and pointing up at the sky, saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And the lesson that that's teaching our kids, and I see as the boys I coach in football and baseball, more and more focus on me, more focus on me, and a lack of understanding about the importance of being a part of something that's bigger than you and that you're a cog in something that's more important than you and that you sacrifice for the people around you. I've, and I think that's kind of what you were touching on about what you're seeing in the NFL, but wh why are we seeing so much of that? Or the guy, you know, in my sport, baseball, who hits a home run. That's what you're supposed to do. You don't have to throw the bat 45 feet in the air, stand at home plate until it lands, stare out at the pitcher, and then start your trot. In the old days, the next pitch would have taken the guy's head off. Today, we'd find them for that. I'm not sure that's good. But why are we seeing so much me versus team in everything we do today? Well, if you think uh, NFL guys do not watch ESPN on Sunday night, we all do. And uh, they want those tweets and those texts from their buddies and their family. Hey, did you see yourself dancing on ESPN? They had you on number seven of the top ten plays of Sunday night or the weekend. And I think it's all about the media. It's all about the media exposing this and accepting it. How do you correct it? You correct it during the week. It's the coaches trying to put discipline in these players, which is a very hard thing to do. Well, when they're making 28 million. It's a hard thing to do. It is very, but if they're doing that at practice. They are, because if you think they could all line up there and they're smart enough on Sunday to get that choir together or the bowling and everyone falls down, they practice that at practice. That just doesn't happen on Sunday, Alf, for reaction because so-and-so scored. They talked about it this week. If you score a touchdown, what are you going to do? And that's how they, the coaches accept it because they practice it during the week. They do. Or they practice it in the locker room. And, and the guys who I played around with, you know, the, the Parcells and the Chuck Knowles and the Cowers, it wasn't accepted. It really wasn't. That was our J-O-B. That was our job. That's what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to throw touchdown passes and uh, look at a scoreboard and hopefully we win a game because that was uh, why we went to work every day. What, um, and, and I think that's sort of also leading to another thing which uh, there's a lot been written about and a lot of people talk about, but because more and more of the focus is on me, I know here we get kids coming in in seventh grade and mom and dad have already decided that they are a one sport athlete. That they are God's gift to fill in the blank, golf, tennis, basketball, football, baseball, you name it. We meet with those parents in a new parents uh, uh, function, and I, I give a little talk, and part of that talk is the importance of playing multiple sports, and particularly in seventh and eighth grade, because you don't know at that age how a kid's going to develop, and Johnny may be the best basketball player in the world, but probably not, and getting a chance to play other sports could be enormously beneficial. And the meeting ends, and they come down, and they come up to me, and they say, that was such a great message. Thank you so much for that. Could I talk to you about my son? Sure. He really is a phenomenal tennis player. And so would there be a way we could have an exception to the rule that they play multiple sports? 
and you just say, what did you not hear in what we just talked about? We're seeing that so much, this focus on one sport and specialization. And I, I personally think it is part of the focus on me. It's about everything's me and my happiness. Well, I, I look at it as, you know, I think each sport helps each other. I mean, uh, basketball, you move your feet, makes me a better quarterback in the pocket. Uh, baseball, you know, I played baseball to my junior year. And I think baseball is very good for my eye-hand coordination. So I think multiple sports playing is an advantage for any athlete. Uh, I do get it with the parents. I, I do do a lot of coaching individually. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustrated parents out there that maybe their careers didn't turn out the way they wanted them to do. And that's hard on you guys. That is very hard because they bring their dreams to you guys and, People always ask me, I'll never forget, especially with Devin, uh, my kids didn't play football. And uh, not because uh, they just didn't want to play football. And I'll never forget, people would come up to my son and say, oh, Devin, when, when you get older, you know, you know, play football like your dad. And uh, thinking he's in eighth grade, he was a junior in high school. So they learned to say, oh, that was my dad's thing. I don't think I'm going to play football. Like, they knew that answer. But uh, I I look at it as multiple sports is great. I really do. And I I think it helps in in, uh, team leadership. Uh, My kids played somewhat outside sports here. The the sports here were very competitive. Uh, Just the history on my kids. So they weren't making many teams here, my two boys. They were late bloomers. And I'll never forget one parent said to me, why don't you keep your kids back? I said, why would I keep my kids back? They do fine academically. I I don't see them running to the NFL or the NBA or anything. Why would I keep them back? Yeah, but they're late bloomers. You know, so-and-so is a year and a half older than them. A year and a half older. No, my kids are fine. If they don't play sports and they keep a 3-0 and keep their heads clean and straight, I'm okay with it. You know, because... Less than 1% go on to play in college. It's, it's a hard, competitive thing. And a lot of parents ask me sometimes, you know, is it, is it worth it? And, and Mark and I had these conversations before about if you could play sports in college and help you get into a better university or better school and, and, and compete and, and be around that team concept, it's well worth it. It really is. And will you take tolls on your body? But if the kid's been concussed two, three times in high school, no way. No way. Go to the other school and don't worry about continuing on playing sports because uh, that CT right now is no joke. It's no joke. Well, and we talk about playing college sports. You, you know this. But here, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is convince more kids to play in college in order to get into a better school. But the focus is almost exclusively at the Division III level. If you look at the boy, we had 20 boys last year. My first year here, we had nine kids that signed to play in college. Most were at D3. One or two were D1. We, just because of the academic nature of D2, we don't send many kids to to, to where the D2 schools of today. Um, This past year, we had 20 boys signed to play. 17 were at the Division III level. And they were able to use that to get into, you know, phenomenal schools, um, phenomenal schools. But every one of those kids, if they come to me in ninth grade with their parents, they're D1 players. And, and they are so convinced that they're going to play at Division I, and they don't realize, first of all, how few people make it to a Power Five conference, mid, major Division I. And I'm talking about mid-major Ivy League. I'm talking about – you know, Big Ten, SEC, et cetera. They don't understand how few do it, and they also don't understand that nowadays that is a lifestyle choice. You are that, – that has become almost like was playing in the NFL years ago. That is your full-time job. Yeah. I, I coached a travel basketball team, and probably seven of the boys were from NBA. And my son was probably the seventh best on that team. And uh, he did play, but not that much, but he did play. And – I'll never forget dealing with 
the parents, and I was making zero money. I was doing this just because I wanted to be around these boys, and I was a very good basketball player, and I wanted to coach these kids and spend time with them. And, you know, that keeps me young, they, they, the stuff they say. And, you know, I would, you know, you know a lot of these kids, so-and-so, get in front of this kid and stop him. And then I'd hear him, like, kid has hair underneath his armpits, like seventh grade kids. I mean, and I learned how to coach these kids. But what I'm getting at is at practice on Tuesday, Thursday nights at Covenant, practice was over at 8 o'clock, uh, pick up your kids. Some of the parents would show up quarter to nine. And I would be spending time with these kids, and they'd be very late. And then when I w the game would happen, the dad would come over to me and say, you know, you should have done this. You should have, you know, done this and this. And I'll never forget, I took my whistle off, and I said, uh, you're more than willing to coach this team if you like. Oh, no, 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 you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. But what I'm getting at, I was always the parent that never said anything in the stands because my dad didn't. And I'm not going to give my two senses unless I give my time. If I'm coaching your kids, then I'm going I'm to say something. Even if you're the head coach or the assistant, that's my biggest fear. I get offered all the time to go back and coach, but I'm afraid I'll be putting 12 hours in if I win or lose. And, and I don't think my wife would want that anymore because when you're committed to coaching, it takes over your life if you're winning or losing because it's a, it's a full-time job. It really is. It's a tough thing as a parent. I'm sure many of you are parents. You have kids. Um, I just about destroyed my own son's baseball career because I kept coaching him until at 14 I realized this isn't going to work anymore because he would go three for four and make several plays at shortstop or second, and I would get in the car and I would say, uh, nice hits, nice plays in the field. Let's focus on that at bat where you had the pop-up and you didn't get a hit, and let's go through that pitch by pitch what your mistakes were. And when we get home, we'll go get in the batting cage and we'll work on that. And at 14, I think I realized I better get out of the way. And I did. And fortunately, he was able to continue loving a sport and continue on and, <clears throat> and, and get himself into a good school with playing baseball. But you and I had some things that kids day, today don't have. You were telling me about the way your dad was. You know, my dad was a World War II vet. He, he you know, was just came out of – he was in Patton's Third Army, spent, I guess, 10 months in the, the European theater, came home at 22, going on 42. And he loved sports, encouraged us to play, came to every game. If I didn't play, no big deal. That was not a big deal. And I remember being in college. I went to a, a small liberal arts college in Minnesota, Gustavus Adolphus College. And I was a wide receiver. In my junior year, I was supposed to be starting, and I was going to be sharing time with this guy, it looked like. And I came home one weekend and just bitched about how, how stupid the coach was, and I was so much better than this guy. And by God, if I wasn't going to play, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to play, if I'm not going to be a starter. And my dad was over there reading the newspaper, and he kind of folded it down, you know. And he looked over, and he goes, hey, if you don't want to play football, don't play football. I don't give a damn. I'm proud of you playing football. I care about what you do in school. That's all that matters. Now, he lived through a depression and a war. Sports were meant to be enjoyed. I never had one time where I felt any pressure from my parents to perform. How many kids today can you say that about? No, I think, it, yeah, it's uh, people like we didn't even get to the point where you know, my dad was an intimidating factor, but who intimidated me the most and who, who to this day... Your mentor. Yes, was more or less my high school football coach, Ted Monica. Probably the hardest guy. You know Ted Monica, one of the winningest coaches in New Jersey. He's 90 years old now, and I still go see him when I go back up to New Jersey. And he was such an uh, intimidator. And back then, you could get away with a lot more than you can now. Uh, he would go around with that golf cart when we would run around that track in full gear on a cinder track with spikes on. And we had to have certain times we had to make. And if we didn't, he would try to hit you with the golf cart. And uh, <laughs> can't do that nowadays. But, you know, he was, uh, he was an intimidating man. And... Uh, 
you know, I respect them. I, I couldn't stand them when I played for them, I'll be honest with you. I could not stand the guy. Uh, but then when I went to college, it was easy. When I went to the NFL, it, you know, I remember the days with Ted Monica, and it actually wasn't too bad. So the, the, the hardest days in training camp were never as bad as the meetings with Ted Monica running around the, the track, uh, you know, with a golf cart chasing you. So, uh, you know, I, at that time I was n naive enough where I didn't respect him for that, but uh, looking back on it all, you know, he's part of the reasons where he pushed me to a limit that he knew I could handle it, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just learned uh, a fear factor in him, a work ethic, and to get the best out of I possibly can out of my body, mind, and soul almost every day because he would try to tear it out of you at practice. He was, he was almost like Parcells in a way. Um, I don't know if you coach this anymore around here, but practice was so hard that on Saturdays when you played the game in high school, you were relieved he was on the sideline because he would stand behind our huddle, and every time I'd drop back, he would scream, now, now, meaning get the ball out of your hands. I'm not protecting you, get the ball out of your hands. So you'd be going home with like a twitch, and by the time that game would come Saturday, he'd be over on the sideline, everything would kind of slow down, and it wouldn't be as hard as that game you thought it would be because he put so much pressure on us during the week to perform, and. Uh, to play it like it was the game that it was actually, well, I know it was having him over there so I didn't have to hear him. It was actually a little more like relaxing <laughs> on, on game day. I think I've got one more topic I'll bring up because I think we're getting kind of close. I know we went with the film first, so we were a little bit adjustment on time, but I want to leave some time for question and answer. So, <clears throat> but, um, these folks are all from boys' schools, and um, you chose to send your sons to an all-boys school. So what are your thoughts about uh, education at an all-boys school, and in particular, the focus we have at MBA with gentlemen, scholar, athlete, focusing on gentlemen. What does that mean to be a gentleman today, um, and in particular with our teaching boys about their relationship with women? Well, I look at it as, you know, an all boys school, you know, you, you have to work on the, you know, not jokingly, the hygiene factor of it all because is, you know, when you're around your buddies all the time, you don't really care how your hair looks or how this looks and this and that. And I know, I know uh, you have a haircut policy here and, and your collars and all that. I, I do understand all that. Uh, but I do like the all-boy concept because of less distractions. We started off with the phones and all that about how distracting they are, but I think when you come to an all-boy school, you're, you're, you're focused at, as at hand. You don't have the other distractions of the hallway and things like that. And I think MBA does a wonderful job in, in, in working with the other schools, meaning like Harpeth Hall. It's an all-girls school here in town. And I think you do do that. How, how you learn the gentleman, I'm sorry, it has to start at home. It has to be around that dinner table at, at, at 6 o'clock or, or 7 o'clock or 5.30 when the parents get home from work. But if you think you're going to teach all that after all these years they've been away from it, it's not that easy. You remember in Oak Hill, they used to have that uh, Dr. C's class where they taught the mannerism and all that. I think that's, that's helpful, but you have to continue it on. Someone has to keep that you know, enforcing that on these young kids. Uh, it's, it, I, I really do think, though, the gentleman part of it all really has to come from, from the home. It does, and I, it's hard on you guys because there's a lot of broken families. I, I get all that, but, you know, you never stop trying, as you know, Mark. If you see some kid not, not being a gentleman in this hallway, I guarantee you one of the advisors or the teachers going to open their mouth because I've seen it done. Yeah. And I know you're with Leslie, your wife, and your daughter, you, you obviously have spent some time focusing with your boys on their relationship with women. I've got two daughters. Um, one's a lawyer. One's in her fourth year of med school. Um, and I try to tell the boys I teach, um, uh, guys, the world has changed. When I first started practicing law, 
and I went to the largest firm here in town, there were not that many women lawyers. And the added, this was the mid, early to mid 80s, and the attitude was, isn't that cute that she's got a law degree? Isn't that, that's a neat thing. Isn't that sweet? And that's sort of how they treated the women lawyers in those days. Um, and those times have come and those times have gone. And I tell the boys in my class, the boss you're going to have in your work, whatever it turns out to be, will likely be a woman. And she will likely be smarter than you. And you better learn today to respect them and look at them as your equals. And if you, if you can't get over that, you're going to have a problem in today's world. And I, I think it's something that, it, that it, it, it's this issue we talked about, about parents um, either being discipline, disciplinarians or being friends. Yep. And too many of them choose to be friends, and they don't lay down the law at home and, and get kids thinking a certain way at home. And you have to lead by example. I mean, uh, you know, when, when you go out to dinner and your kids are there and you see you open your car door for your wife, or your companion, you know, they, they do notice those things. I know it's so easy to click, click, and then do that. We didn't have that when, <laughs> when I was driving. You know? We didn't even have consoles yeah, in the so, middle of the car, remember that? So it's kind of like if you seat. lead by example and show it, and even, even this, how my mom taught me how to eat. I mean, uh, now you got the double elbow, or then they eat like this. It's, it's, uh, it's lead by example like anything in this, in this world, but... Uh, it's it's constant and i say this i have a 23 year old a 21 year old and a 17 year old and it's constant parenting i don't care what age they're at and you think they have it no you have to continue constantly parenting them and i i do it all the time i do it, and then uh and uh, they don't like it but you know as long as you're under my house and you're under my roof i'm gonna keep teaching what i know Let's throw it open to some questions and, and uh, for wh whatever you might have, whatever topic. Boys, raising boys, teaching boys, NFL, you name it. What do you got? Yep. For coming in on the Saturday morning and speaking to us. Uh, questions about um, something you touched on earlier, which is the, the outside of school, club sports, travel teams. Uh, what I've seen in, in my 15 years, I teach in Manhattan, and I teach fifth grade, is that there's been a growing conflict between the desire to participate in this sport and what the requirements are for, for, for my boys and the academic load of school. So I have, I have 11 year olds who are traveling from the Upper East Side of Manhattan to Menin Arena for six o'clock ice time on a Wednesday night. Uh, you know, it's an hour and a half each way. You know. Is that a school sport or is that when you're... It is not. Yeah. And so, so it's not something that, you know, the school is in, in charge of how it, how it impacts. And, and I have, you know, it's tricky because there are parents who will email me and, and they, go, you know, they say, you know, can we have Friday and Monday off because we're going to Buffalo for a tournament? And hockey but, with the ice times. And really? ice times is impossible. Yeah. But it's also for basketball, for squash. Yeah. And, and, you know, they always sum it up with, and we know school is important, school is number one, but yeah. we're going to miss some time. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I think the adults have killed this for the kids. Um, and I, I know you sound like such an old, you know what, when you say this, but there was a time when you could play three sports. I played three sports in high school. You played three sports in high school. They didn't overlap. So... Let me show you today. When I was in high school, I played summer baseball. We had captain's practices one night a week in football, and the basketball coach encouraged us to come up if we weren't working in the mornings in the summer and shoot free throws. That was how the sports overlapped. Today, our football team has workouts at 6.30 a.m. Monday through Thursday from 6.30 to 9. The basketball team has tryouts in the summer and two team camps in the summer where they literally go somewhere and play for a week and play other teams. And, oh, by the way, that's baseball season. So you're playing travel baseball and you're maybe playing 50 games and going all over the country and trying to go to showcases and be seen. But when you do that, you're going to miss the basketball oh, and football. Oh, miss that too. And so what we've done is we've created 
all these sports have become year-round sports. Why? Because the travel folks and the AAU folks have gone to the parents and said, if you want him to play fill-in-the-blank in college, he needs to be doing this year-round. The parents buy into it, they pay the money for it, and the kids are out there with their tongue hanging out trying to do even two sports, much less three, all because somewhere someone thinks they're going to get that 1% that gets an athletic scholarship to a major university, and it's 1%. And that's what I think is sad to see, is that they've torn the joy out of playing. But how do you correct that? You don't, because you hear, let me just tell you, and then you, you jump in. It, if I were to say to our headmaster, we're not doing that, we're not having basketball stuff in the summer, and we're not doing football but one night a week, my basketball and football people rightfully so would say, Every team we're playing is going to do it because the Tennessee High School League allows them. So I, you're okay with us finishing last in everything we do. And then you lose your job as a coach. I don't. But, yeah, do. but yeah. you know what I mean. No? Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's like to get a child home for dinner at 6 o'clock, I get it. It's, it's unheard of now. And uh, how, do you, how do you change that? I mean, it's a – these kids are smart enough. They know a scoreboard, and they know uh, wins and losses, and they know grades, and, and the coach is going to be judged by how many games they win. I mean, I say all the time in the NFL, players make plays. I mean, a lot of these coaches sleep in their, sleep in their offices, and I'm like, you don't have to do that, coach. I mean, a slant's a slant. If someone catches a ball and makes two guys miss and – and a 60-yard touchdown pass, I threw the ball five yards. I didn't throw it 60 yards. I threw it five yards, and that guy made me look good. I said, so I think what, what now with coaches and youth sports is so much overload. Like, there's so much special conditioning, special coaching. Let's try this. I don't know if any of you guys ever saw, like, Dak Prescott when he gets loose before the game with his hips. I would have hip surgery if I did that when I played. Uh, it's like all these things that parents are paying for and letting their kids do all this extra specialized training, coaching, it's overkill. No, big Play, time. Players make plays. They do. They, it's not, my, favorite, my favorite one is the, the travel baseball team for 10-year-olds that I read a little flyer about a few years ago where the guy – put together this team, and he's basically said, you know, da, 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 you need to play. This is what we're going to do. We're going to play 84 games. We're going to do – this is 10-year-olds. And he said – bottom line, he said, if you want your kid to get to the next level, he needs to be on this team. What is the next level for a 10-year-old? <laughs> Being 11, isn't it? And yet these people are paying – $2,500 to put their kid on that team and play 80-something games, and they wonder why they get to high school and the kid's elbow. I never heard of some of the injuries that our kids have today. Anyway, next question. Yeah. Because in part there's this industry that's, that's really exploiting these, these uh, parental ambitions and, and student ambitions, and, and like you said, it's not going to pay off for 99.99%. All right, that's one thing. There's research, there's increasing research that shows how detrimental it is to specialize at a young age. There's nothing that supports the idea that you're actually going to achieve that goal by specializing at a young age. There's no evidence that supports that. So it, I, and we try to teach our families about that, and it's hard. It is so hard because of that outside pressure. So I guess I'm asking for help, too. I don't, we're trying the to change outside, the culture. The yourself. outside coaches he's talking about. Before we came over here, you know, do you see the conflict between – the coach who's coaching on the outside and what you are absolutely I just in, in baseball I'll be really specific I got a kid who's 5'10 145 he plays second base with an 80 mile an hour wind he might get hit the ball over the fence if he hit it perfectly one time he goes to a hitting coach who played major league baseball he teaches all of the kids to hit the same way he holds a bat at the bottom he swings as hard as he can with a ton of torque you know, he cannot reach outside pitches because he's all torque here. He doesn't use his hands right. We try to explain to him, we want you to choke up, get on top of the ball, put the ball on the ground, you're fast, you have a chance to get on base, and when you get on base, you score runs, which is what we're supposed to do as a team. <laughs> and he won't do it. It's not just this kid, it's tons of them. They're going to do what the guy 
who mommy and daddy are paying, tell them to do, even though it makes no sense. So right, I don't kid. coach. Yeah. So I don't coach. And the hard thing is, like, I didn't start playing football until I was in eighth grade. How about the burnout rate of these kids nowadays? Uh, forget physically, mentally also. I mean, they get the sophomore, junior in high school, they don't want to play sports anymore because dad had them up at 6 a.m. for the past six months in a gym practicing with uh, this specialized trainer. That's, that's, I didn't do any of that. I, 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 so like you were saying, there's no proof saying that if you start at this age and start specializing in this game, you'll be the next Tiger Woods. You know, and uh, as great as Tiger is, he has a lot of demons he deals with also. And I don't, I don't know the happy balance, how you figure this out, where maybe, you know, we talk about playing multiple sports is great, but maybe, like, I remember I took most of my hard classes at Maryland in the spring because I knew the, you know, the workload wasn't as much for spring practice. We only really went out there on the field maybe 21 days in the spring. Now we had time slots where we had to work out, so we had to choose, do you lift weights at 7 a.m., do you lift weights at 3 p.m., or do you lift weights at 7 p.m.? Yep. So I don't know. That, that's, that's just hard balance how you, how you can figure out without burning these kids out and how they can continue to strive in the classroom and strive in sports. It's, 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 a, it's a parent issue too, which I think, and can the state ever – you know, but then what are you going to be turning on lights late at night if, if parents want to go practice with their kids and, and stop them from playing? I don't think you can do that. Yeah. Other question. Yep. One more. One Time for one more question. Yeah. Overprogrammed kids, three season athletes. I work with younger boys, and we often tell the need for unstructured time, unstructured play. But then how do you reconcile that with unstructured play might lead to more time with devices, phones, social media? Do you have thoughts on how you reconcile all those ideas? Uh, they're probably not very popular. I think, <clears throat> I think parents need to parent, you know? I mean, when my kid was having trouble, he turned out to be a pretty dadgum good student, didn't he, Tim? You know? um, but he had trouble in, at Oak Hill, and he had trouble in seventh and eighth grade. He, I, he, he was laughing the other day, the highest grade he ever made in grammar, on a grammar quiz at Emmett Russell's class was a 55. Um, but when he was senior, he won the best writing award contest. And what we did was we put his phone in a different room when he studied, starting in about seventh or eighth grade, and you just didn't touch the phone until you were done. And there are parents who don't do that. And so what, what, I, what I see on the sports side of things, you and I talked about this, is the unstructured time is the best time. That's when kids learn to play the game the right way. And I'll give you, again, a concrete example. There are boys who have basketball coaches who work with them all the time. We have boys who get gym time on Saturdays, Sundays, even at night during the weekday, and they come out with a coach. Nothing wrong with that, but here's the deal. All they ever do when they practice basketball is practice basketball with the ball in their hand. They don't play six or eight hours out on the driveway the way we did and see the flow of the game because basketball is played lots of, of basketball is played without the ball in your hand. You are playing defense. You are moving without the ball. You are watching where everyone else goes. And so what you begin to see are these kids who can dribble and shoot and have these wonderful ball skills, but when you throw them in a game, they have no game savvy. They don't know where anyone else on the court is. They've not played the game that much. And that's where, the, the, that's where we're hurting our kids again. We, sure. we put them in that situation as opposed to just saying, go to the playground and play basketball for five or six hours. You know, it's so sad, Mark, and I would talk about this earlier. If, if you ended your class earlier, okay, and you said, okay, the last 10, 15 minutes, you guys can talk amongst each other or go outside and – shoot hoops or play tackle football out on a new turf field, uh, the next 15 minutes are your own, so do whatever you wish. I say 95% would take their phones out. No question, because I've and done that's, that. And that's <laughs> sad. I finish, a class, sad. I finish a class 10 minutes early, and I say, all right, guys, you know, everybody's got their test in. We're not going to start on Chapter 5 till tomorrow. So you've got 10 minutes. Use it to study. If you want to visit quietly with your neighbor, you can. 
they don't visit quietly with their neighbor. They visit quietly with their phone. YouTube, see what's out on YouTube. You know, it's, 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 it's a, a, you know, it's good and bad. Like I said, the technology, but it's, it's hard. It's hard. And I know what a lot of you are dealing with right now. We've it's, solved it's, lots of problems. It's very today. hard. I know we have. Thank you for your questions very much.